Welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. The Understanding Boys podcast is a series of conversations exploring what it is to be a good man these days. And if you had a story that you could tell a boy of, say, 14 and he'd listen, what would that story be? And that's really what I'm asking our guests today. I'm Dr. Ray Swan, and we're a community of teachers and parents concerned with the education and growth of boys and young men in the modern world. This series is brought to you by Brighton Grammar and All Boys School in Melbourne. To learn more about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. In our conversation today, we speak with Professor Jackie True. Jackie is Professor of International Relations and Director of Monash University Centre for Gender, Peace and Security. She's authored over 14 books and 100 articles and book chapters with her work on gender, uh, global governance, violence against women, women, peace and security, along with feminist methodologies. Her major book, The Political Economy of Violence Against Women, won the American Political Science Association's 2012 Biennial Prize for the Best Book in Human Rights. In the conversation today, we talk with Jackie about her parenting, what she learned during the lockdown this year, and also a little bit about how we can start to connect our boys into understanding better ways of being for the benefit of all. I hope you enjoy the conversation today. So joining us in today's podcast is Professor Jackie True. Jackie, welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast today. It's lovely to have you here. Great to be here, Ray. Thanks. So I thought a good place for us to start is just on on being a mum and we were just chatting off mic, you know, about um, about parenting and wow, what a crazy year it's been. I guess it must have really challenged you as a parent at times. Do, do you have anything that you can share, any insights or things you learned about parenting this year and what's been a really tough year for everybody? Yes, it definitely has been a tough year. Um, but on the other hand, I'm always sort of looking for the silver lining, uh, even in the moments of challenge and crisis and I think for this year in in my family anyway it's meant I haven't traveled at all and nor has my husband and so everybody's been home and I think actually our two boys really they might not say it if you ask them (laughs) but uh, they've actually really appreciated it and especially having a son in year 12 I don't think he really likes it when we're all overseas and Um, So I think that's brought some stability. And at the same time, I think, quite frankly, we've had uh, more time with them. And my older son even said this year, he said, oh, mum, it's been really nice um, to hang out with you in my last year before I'm an adult. That's great. (laughs) And I thought, oh, that's brilliant. Um, I hadn't thought of it that way. Because they haven't had uh, any alternatives, they've actually had to hang out with mum and dad. And one thing that we did, which I think has built some um, family solidarity, um, we decided to have a weekly sort of film festival and we decided to alternate who chose the film each week. And we basically stuck to it. So everybody had their chance and then you had to watch everyone's film. And quite frankly, I had to watch some rather violent (laughs) films that I never personally chosen. I've also watched Japanese animation many times. Again, something I wouldn't have chosen. But I think that that's meant that the kids feel like, you know, we have a bit of um, give and take and um, a bit of mutual respect. So it's been, been very good, I think, on the family front. Yeah, that's fantastic. And and just as just by way of uh, anecdote, what is the what's your go to film, Jackie? Well, I wouldn't say go to, but we watched a very good Australian film called The Nightingale. It's set in Tasmania and it's about colonization. It's it is very violent and and I to- uh, toyed with that. Do we need such violence in order to show what happened? You know, when the British Army was was based in in Tasmania. So it is hard to watch, but nonetheless, I suspect that was a good side of it for the boys. Um, but I think it was a really powerful, you know, evocation of, of the connections between Indigenous violence and gendered violence, violence against women, and also the potential solidarity between um, settlers uh, and Indigenous peoples in Australia. So I really recommend it. It's also by a wonderful Australian female filmmaker, and it's been quite um, praised in, internationally as well. It's a tough question, isn't it? That level of, you know, it seems like a hook, like an easy hook, particularly with boys that, you know, you watch a a film that might for us be a bit problematic in terms of the levels of violence. And then 
um, but it seems a hook and a way to sort of promote or to, to begin a, a conversation. It, it is a hard thing to know um, whether it's a good thing to sort of show that and thereby almost advocate it um, or, or, or or not. But, um, you know, I tend to think that you're right. It, it's good if you can sort of have something that's common ground and, and find a way to, to connect through that. Yeah, I think the conversations that films provoke is really important. So, and, and that would be, you know, with explicit content as well, um, because we can't um, sort of cotton wool or um, sugarcoat society or the real world and some things we can't not see. So I think it's good good opportunity to, to promote that critical thinking and analysis and, and as well as some kind of emotional response and thinking through that um, with your kids. Yeah, it's almost like a – yeah, and, and the age and stage and, and both your boys are getting a little bit older now towards the, the latter part of, of adolescence and, and how you sort of know, you know, as a parent, what when when is the right time? I know for me I used a, a website called Common Sense Media. I don't know if you came across that. It's actually based in the States, but that has like quite a lot of different ratings. You can kind of look at different kinds of aspects and, and think about that. I, I found that was quite helpful in the early days. But then, of course, you know, my kids – I'd sort of say, oh, we could watch this movie and it's a bit, and they'd be like, oh, Dad, you know, I already saw it at a friend's place. <laughs> My kids don't mind seeing movies, you know, that they like <laughs> 10 times. They're still going through the Harry Potter phase and the Lord of the Rings phase and how many times can you watch those? <laughs> yeah, well, not enough, I think, if you're asking me, particularly with the, um, with the Lord of the Rings phases. So with the year of lockdown and, you know, improving the connections, um, you know, if you, and just zooming out a little bit on, on being a mum, you know, what, what would you say again, some of the, the broader tips that you would have on, on raising boys and what, what are some of the really important things that we need to connect our boys into? Oh, those are really big questions and I, I really don't count myself as any kind of an expert on parenting other than on my own experience. And I think my kids teach me more about how to be a parent than, you know, than vice versa, perhaps. I was raised in a family of girls, but one of the things I've realised is that girls tend to talk too much, and I definitely talk a lot. And my boys now will just simply tell me that's enough. (laughs) Um, So I've learned to sort of be more succinct. Um, I've also learned to listen in a different way, um, which is I listen or I ask a question and then I wait, and I literally have to count Um, until they register (laughs) before I ask the second question. And I'm sure that's common to many mums, Um, but it seems ridiculous, but it actually works. Um, You actually get a response if you don't ask three questions at once, if you just ask one and then count to five. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a very basic tip, but um, I think, you know, sort of more generally, I think a a big thing about probably raising kids and not, not just raising boys is to really provide them with the opportunities that you think are going to uh, enable them to explore their talents and their potentials. And so, you know, for me, I've always um, worked full time and um, had my own career, um, but that's enabled the resources so that my kids can do the things and explore the interests and talents that they have. Um, And I also think that's been really important because they've seen their mum and they've seen other women as being really important role models. Um, until my oldest son was about five, he honestly thought all professionals were women. He didn't realise there was any male in the medical establishment at all. Um, and, of course, at that time we were living in New Zealand and the Prime Minister was a female. So I think that had a huge impact on him. But I think it's really important, therefore, to, to um, make sure that boys have good female role models or, you know, able to, you know, interact with women and girls as well as men and boys, even if they go to an all-boys school. That's really important. Of course, they will have female teachers. That's something I'd emphasise, and perhaps that's a bit counter to what we think, that boys need a range of male role models, but I would also say they need good female role models too about, um, you know, the different ways of seeing the world and being in the world. That's great advice, Jackie, and the research really does bear that out as well. We know that, you know, kids as young as four and five are already you know, starting to include and exclude you know, jobs and job types and career propositions based on gender. It's quite extraordinary how early that comes in and the advice to, you know, help boys to see really different um, kinds of folks doing really different kinds of things uh, to challenge some of those things. Because so, they seem so culturally embedded, don't they? The ways, you know, we're talking about movies. I mean, so many of the movies are just really reinforcing 
uh, strongly reinforcing sort of ways of being that are, I guess, the, sort of the typical male and female ways of being, and even the suggestion that that's, there's a sort of binary around that. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think kids of these days, especially Australian young people, are becoming more adept at kind of decoding those gender stereotypes and roles. And a lot of them come from the United States, and which is a, you know, which sort of dominates our global culture, but um, it's not the same society and culture that, that we have. Um, so I, I do, I, you know, and I, I think there are changes even there. I mean, certainly my kids are looking forward to the second Wonder Woman movie yeah. next year. Yeah. Um, and they have their own critical analysis about how Wonder Woman is portrayed and, um, and uh, you know, the male role models as well. So I think these are, these are all things that we, we need to navigate with, with critical analysis. They exist. But having said that, um, certainly the kinds of stories, the kinds of ways we talk to our kids when they're young, really really matters I just remember this brilliant anecdote my son was in year two my younger one uh, at Brighton Grammar School Um, and uh, I wasn't able to help with the the, the reading groups but um, another mum who did help uh, managed to pass on to me that um, when the boys were speaking about which superhero they most uh, admired that my son had said it was Wonder Woman and uh, you know he was very happy with that he wasn't embarrassed in one one little sense and I don't think any of the other boys were at all yeah. you know fazed by that either so at that point they were very open to that and there were very good reasons why you'd want to uh, I think he had really good reasons like you know she fought the good war and she had a good cause and good good kind of weapons yeah, I was going to say the weapon is pretty things. cool this is like a lassoey type thing is that right I, I'm a bit, yeah, exactly. bit hazy on that yeah, yeah. golden lasso yeah yeah, in any case, so I think those, what, those stories and, uh, are really important early on for a society, not just for a school, but of course schools where they happen. And so even if we're thinking about the kinds of narratives we have, um, you know, with regard to Indigenous people, with regard to war traditions, uh, I think it's really important to just sort of have multiple vantage points on that so we don't reinforce the same gender stereotypes because gender stereotypes are really constraining for boys as well as girls, as well as other kids who, you know, don't identify with being a boy or a girl. They're deep imprints, aren't they? And it, it's amazing, like, when we think about, I, I'm a bit influenced at the moment, I've been reading this Ian McGilchrist book on um, the master in chemistry and the two types of thinking, you know, in terms of the of the brain and, and the, you know, the logical and the, I guess the whole brain way of thinking and and it just always strikes me about how powerful narratives are in how they form and shape us and, and our cultures. And we think about the impact of something so simple as reading a, you know, a, a story that can challenge a stereotype to a young person and that can stay with them their whole life to the point where, you know, they don't see anything wrong. You know, there's so, so much more diversity yet, yet we sort of are quick to discount the power of some of those things because they may not seem like they've got a big impact factor or a you know, the, the effect size may not seem so big right at the start, but it, we, we know it is on another level. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think about Pippi Longstocking when I was a kid and this is really popular recently um, in Sweden. They celebrated 100 years uh, of Pippi Longstocking. And, of course, Sweden has, like, a really impressive um, sort of fairly gender equal society, like not completely equal but relative you know, in, in the scheme of things, one of the most gender equal societies. And, um, you know, not surprising when you see some of those early archetypes, Pippi Longstocking being that strong, self, self-taught, self independent uh, child, uh, girl who, um, you know, was kind of like, you know, rode her horse and was, you know, more impressive uh, in her physical feats than, than any boy in the neighbourhood. So, and, and that, I think that carries through into some of the, the norms uh, and role models in, in Swedish society as, as well. So, so Sweden is um, government since I think 2016 has called itself a feminist government and they even have a feminist foreign policy where they put, uh, you know, gender equality and equal rights for women and men as, at the centre of all of their diplomacy and all of their aid and support to to other countries in the world. So I think it's pretty impressive that you can see something quite at a micro level and you can see how that feeds into every aspect of the society. Jackie, just on that, you know, in terms of taking a feminist perspective, if if you were to, again, with your own boys or just anecdotally and appreciate this may not be 
you know, from a parenting perspective in your wheelhouse. But you know, if you're starting to get boys to think a bit about feminism and, and looking at different ways in which power is set up and, you know, the impact of gender across, um, you know, globally and how that then relates into some of the other areas that hopefully we'll explore in, in our conversation today, what, what might be some ways in um, that, that could be useful for maybe some of the mums and dads that are, that are listening in at the moment and thinking, well, how do I kind of broach that? Yeah, I mean, I think you always have to start with where your kids are at, like, and the things that they're concerned about. So, I mean, I just might give an example. Um, One of my sons uh, was sort of kind of around puberty and I kind of saw himself, you know, he said something about, well, mum, I really want to build up my muscles because I want to be really strong. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, yes, the girls like that. And I said, oh, okay. Okay. And I said, well, how do you know that? Have you, have you, have you asked any girls? Um, and I think, you know, that, that's, that's kind of like that's an opening, isn't it? Yeah. That's an entry point where you can start to explore those kind of assumptions. Well, actually, um, you know, is that the most important thing in a boy or a young man is, you know, the size of his muscles? Um, maybe, maybe for some, but it's probably not the only thing. Um, and I suppose it's just to try to broaden their understanding of who they can be um, and that, that that's actually broader than what they think and maybe what they're hearing even from their friends or from, from TV, um, from other kind of cues, and to try to sort of reward and, and, and praise and, and reinforce a range of different aspects of their personality or their, their capability or their, their interests and not just those stereotypical traits that boys should be brave and strong and tough which is a really limited understanding of boys and masculinity. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm very keen to, um, Jackie, to talk a little bit about your work and uh, understand currently for some years now you've been Director of the Centre for Gender, Peace and Security uh, at Monash. C- can you tell us a little bit about that work and, and what, it is you, what it is that you do and how it sort of intersects between your academic interests and your writing imp- interests and how you sort of impact on on uh, policies more, more broadly? I guess, you know, the, the Centre, Gender, Peace and Security Centre at Monash University is one of five in the world and uh, we're the only one focused really on the Asia-Pacific region. Um, and and our, the centre is really linked to the United Nations Security Council's Agenda on Women, Peace and Security. And that uh, agenda commemorates 20 years this year. Um, back in 2000, uh, the Security Council, which is the the agency of really of the United Nations that has that authorizes the peacekeeping forces for conflict. That's really um, the only uh, institution that has the ability to use force. Um, in any case, they passed this resolution. Uh, it's called Resolution 1325. It's famous now. It's spawned a transnational network, and it's recognizing the different impacts of conflict on women and men. Um, And the fact that, you know, for most of our history and really until recently, this has hardly changed that, it, you know, that uh, those who are engaged in in, uh, peacemaking, you know, kind of setting the frameworks for society emerging from conflict have been men. Uh, And that women, even though they've been, you know, affected by war, often disproportionately to the Mm. extent that uh, they may, you know, they may be experiencing specific types of violence, they may be widowed, they may be stuck with being, with, with you know, the recovery of the society, um, but they don't actually have a stake in deciding the institutions and how they're designed. So that agenda set to, to redress that um, and to mandate equal participation of women and men uh, in all aspects of peace and security. Um, including peace processes, but all aspects of peace and security, which would even mean like defence forces as well as diplomacy. So um, would that mean for representation so in terms of groups and, and discussion and, and working parties? Is that one of the ways in which it, it's sort of been borne out into, into practice? Yeah, so I think there's lots of challenges in translating it into practice, but certainly there's been much more promotion now of that you can't actually have a peace deal when women are not at the table. Um, And obviously there's a diversity of women and they're not always on one side of the conflict um, and they reflect different perspectives, you know, with regard to ethnicity and religion, um, age and so on. Um, But but it's actually not legitimate 
to make peace with only men at the table. Um, and so that idea is, has been progressed and it's very difficult to, to bring that into fruition if we think about Afghanistan today, which is currently engaged in intra-Afghan talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban. Now, the Taliban, of course, was the the uh, violent extremist group that you know set back women's rights a uh, century uh, in the 1990s when they ruled. So it's a very difficult situation. Taliban never want women at the table. They actually don't want women at school, let alone, uh, let alone in uh, the political realm or in in the labour market. So it's kind of you know it's it's a very um, sensitive diplomacy uh, and activism that has really tried to change that so that even the Taliban cannot legitimately rule. Um, without attending to gen- gender equality. And so in Afghanistan, there's been massive gains in the last 20 years um, in women's rights and, um, you know, girls' schooling. And, you know, I think that's the sort of gains that, w- that we want to preserve. Um, so that's part, you know, part of what we've been doing is looking at, you know, practically how do we not only include women, but how do we include perspectives promoting gender equality within the context of peace negotiations and peace talks, but also we're really attentive to the dynamics of violence and conflict as well. So we try to look at both sides, peace and conflict, and we have, um, in in the last sort of four years, we've been looking very closely at the gender dynamics of violent extremism and terrorism. So again, in the past, people have always thought terrorism is men's business, Mm. like it's men who perpetrate terrorism, we should be afraid of them. But in fact, increasingly terrorist groups from everything from ISIS and uh, Islamist extremism through to far right and even far left extremism are actively targeting and recruiting young women. Um, And they're using quite, you know, they're using quite, uh, you know, you might say they're often using strategies which might seem even feminist. They're they're associating belonging to their group and perpetrating violence as a kind of empowerment. Right. Um, So what we've said is that if if we actually want to stop, prevent the spread of violent extremism, we actually need to understand gender as well as these groups do. And we need to have much more specific strategies that are they're attentive to the different ways in which young men and young women are attracted to these groups and the dynamics within the groups themselves so but one of the things that we've found that's really common to all forms of violent extremism and and the UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres has actually picked up our research for the last couple of years and we've been funded our research has been funded by the United Nations, but we've found that actually the, the common factor in extremist groups is their sexism, their sexist right. ideals, their gendered ideology. So whilst they often, you know, try to attract young women and young men to the groups, that, that they actually purport a kind of a, not a, a really regressive conservative gendered ideology, which is based on the subordination of women and usually plays up these ideas of men as protectors, men as the ones who should, you know, lead their societies. Um, And that's often linked to a really strong uh, racist or, you know, religious narrative about um, the sort of state of nature. So, but what we found is that, you know, that, that those individuals who hold sexist ideas and, you know, maybe uh, justify forms of violence against women they're much more likely to support violent extremism and, 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 and to participate or join those groups. Wow, okay. Yeah, there's a lot in that. I mean, I'm just even going back to what you were saying about the recruitment. So in terms of the inclusion and exclusion, so it sounds like from what you're saying is that some of the extremist groups are actually using as a driver sort of inclusive principles in a sense to sort of say, well, look, you can be part of this um, and using almost – I guess cultural tropes that might appear to some of appealing to to some of the the women that they're appealing to, but at the same time, they're enforcing it with um, some of the more traditional sort of patriarchal exclusory um, tactics as well. And and that, from what you're saying, the research is also showing that those that are more likely to perpetrate it are in fact more misogynistic and more racist or more sort of around um, you know targeting certain 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 groups to say you're not part of, and then enacting violence um, against them. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think that's right. And I think that, um, 
you know, I mean, you've got to look at it from from the angle not only of young women but also from of young men and, and in societies where there are really strict gender norms and to be a good man is to be a breadwinner, to be a protector, a provider, and yet they're living in societies where they can't achieve that status, you know, because of, you know, the, the, the structural uh, unemployment uh, and, you know, the impact, for example, of the global financial crisis, which had a particular impact on parts of the world. And uh, so they can't get a job. They can't, if you can't get a job, you can't pay bride price. You can't form a family. You won't be recognized in your community. So how are you going to achieve that if you're a young man? What are you going to do? And there are these groups there and they are, they are providing an income, a job. They're providing a status. Um, and that will enable you, enable you to, um, you know, to be recognized. And uh, so, and I think a lot of, you know, if you talk, I mean, I could be talking about Libya there where we've done research or the Philippines and, um, you know, that they would also say that, you know, some, and this would also relate to even if we think about Australia and the rise of far right extremism here and, you know, just, mentioning, uh, you know, Brendan Tarrant, who, you know, the Christchurch uh, terrorist, you know, that, that, that uh, these kind of acts and this kind of belonging, you know, gives them an identity uh, and a sense of self that they apparently could not achieve before. I think we should be really, really concerned about those gender dynamics. Not many people have discussed that with regard to Brendan Tarrant, but, um, you know, I think there's some really notable facts in his background um, that suggest that uh, embedded sexism also linked to the fact, you know, the death of his father, the lack of a sense of belonging in the community from whence he came and the way he felt a sense of belonging with this transnational extremist, racist, white nationalist movement. With that, Jackie, you know, in in terms of your work and I guess a I was fortunate to be able to tune into um, a, a webinar that you're involved with last week, and what really struck me was that there's almost like distinct phases of of this process in the sense it's so the level of complexity. And the first one struck me as about identifying what's actually going on, knowing, starting to see what are the working parts and and how do they sort of talk. And you've sort of described what some of those are, um, and I know we're probably only scratching the surface of it. Um, the next phase I imagine is about well, what, what can be done and what sorts of things work uh, and that's where, it, where the research sort of interfaces with the policy and we start then implementing things that are, have an evidence base but then they have an evaluative framework as well because, you know, we need to know and politicians need to know that they're getting some value on return and that they're doing the right kinds of things. From your perspective, where, where do you sort of see the future of this going? Where are we going to start to be able to... Uh, see some change and, and are there any things that even you know the old green um is it greenpeace the think you know think globally and act locally um that we can start to be doing with our own kids um you know around um our, our consideration of gender yeah no that's so true and, and i think even when we work in universities we're really keen to translate our research uh into practical programs policies outcomes and so on like we do want to have an impact in our lifetime I think a lot of the import of our research is also showing the importance of having what I would call a gender sensitive or responsive approach. And that means that you do have to take into account the kind of scripts or norms of masculinity and femininity um, and how they affect, you know, boys, girls, and those who don't identify with binary gender differently. Um, so that, for example, you know, engaging boys and, and definitely having the kind of positive masculinity program that you do at Brighton Grammar is very important. It's not the only thing you need to do. And I would say, you know, obviously you want to have ways to, to promote gender equality and to give them a, a real sense of what that might mean practically. But certainly trying to broaden the understanding of what it means to be a man and, and what that looks like and what the range of different pathways are and how, how the society rewards you for those different, um, those different pathways. I think that that's, that's really, really important. It seems to me that, that like when we look at the use of violence and we look at also gender-based violence, which is a huge problem in Australia, um, 
if we look at, uh, you know, family and domestic violence, for example, which is primarily perpetrated against women and children by men, is a huge problem and it's not going away. And the more we know about it, the more... <laughs> the more there is of it. And we've seen that this year during COVID. I mean, it's phenomenal. You know, one in six, according to the this, this online survey done by the Australian Criminological Association, is that one in six women in Australia has experienced gender-based violence this year. It's really, really high. Usually you'd expect that once in a lifetime. So that means that we have to do more and, and, and we have to do better. Um, and I think that does mean uh, really targeting, um, especially, you know, boys, like, and the ways in which they deal with emotions and the way in which they relate to other people and the way that they uh, think about, you know, relations to, to girls and women. So I think, you know, that kind of foundation of understanding what, what respectful relationships look like um, is crucial um, as a long-term prevention strategy, but it is a strategy I think that could bear fruit um, within this this generation. So the evaluations of secondary school programs that um, really focus on gender-based violence and um, sometimes separately boys and girls, but sometimes together, those are some of the few programs that have been shown to work and to be effective. Um, so, you know, I would, um, you know, I'm not, sure the extent to which you do that at BGS but I think that that would be something to think about Um, because what we're also seeing in some of the surveys in Australia is that young people don't even really know what gender-based violence is they don't even know what domestic violence is Um, and sometimes they think that aggression and hitting that that's somehow okay and that that's that's not violence so I think you know these you know I think we do need to tackle this problem head on. And I think the role of, the role of you know, teachers, schools, but also friends and bystanders is increasingly being um, encouraged. And it does, it takes us right back to the start with, you know, we're talking about the movies and, you know, normalised gender violence in films, you know, up until, and I think a lot of the Bond films that are, you know, shown, uh, I mean, they're right up until very recent times, that was just, you would say, well, what's gender violence? And you'd, t- you'd watch a film like that and, or something that, has become more clear, I think, uh, is the impact of coercive control as well on on, um, on on lots of people, but women in particular. And, you know, another thing I took away from the webinar last week was just about uh, the, what was described as a shadow pandemic in terms of gender violence and what's been happening with COVID because, of course, you know, the, the most dangerous place for many women is, it's a, and it's a terrible reality, is the home. Even more, even that is even true as I understand it, even in conflict zones. Yeah, exactly. So even if you live in Afghanistan and, you know, you've got the Taliban at your doorstep, you're still most likely to be killed in your home So and severely injured. And I think that's the other really huge concern about 2020 during COVID and what the UN Secretary General called the, the shadow pandemic of gender-based violence is that the violence, it's not just that more people are experiencing, more women are experiencing it, uh, in their homes, which is not safe, but that the violence is increasingly severe. And that's what we've also seen in our research in Australia. And even two weeks ago, I was listening to various, uh, those who judges from the courts who've been dealing with some of the cases that have come through the virtual courts this year. And these are really egregious cases of, of strangling, stabbing, um, more than in previous years. And we'll, we'll, we'll know more, I guess, as, as the research comes in, but that, that's really concerning. Um, so I don't know to what extent, you know, the violent culture that we have and the, certainly the, the film and the video games is a part of that. But one thing I would say is that coming back to the films is that films can be a really good point of discussion and that mm. could be a really good way of um, actually starting a conversation with, with teenage boys about, you know, what's appropriate, what's, you know, what's, what's wrong with this or, you know, what do they think about this? Um, because certainly the Bond movies, as much as they love them, uh, you know, uh, a lot of what's, what's in those movies from the right through to the 1980s is really unacceptable, not yeah, that- only in terms of the representations of men and women, but in terms of the, the acts of violence, yeah. And it was interesting, I, I think it was Daniel Craig who expressed sentiment in, in that he felt uncomfortable with the role in that in that sense and it is hard isn't it when we're talking about you know fictionalized characters but then their impact on 
culture is actually real. It's no longer fiction when when people are seeing it. It's actually having a normalising effect on things. Um, and I know for myself, I've been guilty of of not really recognising um, those things early enough. Um, you know, and the impact that they can have. You know, on all of us in my, my own self, I, I suppose, even in just in my thinking about. You know, becoming aware and taking the—I think the in the mythology spectrum, it's the it's the scales falling away from the eyes a little bit and becoming more aware of actually what's what's happening in the layers of it and the and the complexity. And I think a lot of our conversation today has really been able to touch on some of those layers because it, it seems like one thing, but it's actually something else um, as well. It's happening at the same time, and and the role of research uh, taking in, in, to, to point what you were saying about not wanting to. To go over, you know, the academic sphere too much, but we do need that real, that real, um, you know, people like yourself in the work that you're doing, really, actually, critically, analysing and then evaluating, you know, what, what's actually going on, so that we can get a really clear picture of things and we can start to, you know, look at making changes. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's exactly right. And I think the finding from our research that shows that sexist attitudes more than religion or religious fundamentalism is driving violent extremism, that's that's a really significant finding that um, is being taken up. And I expect to see you know, rethinking of programs and policies uh, in the coming years as a result of that research. So I'm, I'm really proud that at uh, Monash University, we've uh, you know we've been able to partner with the UN on that, um, and, and of course it takes it down a level to think about you know what what might that mean uh, in Australia and, and schools. But uh, but I think there are there are real connections there. Yeah, that's amazing. Going back to you know yourself reading Pippi Longstocking as a kid and where you are now, did you had you always been someone who felt passionately about this kind of work and, and differences, someone who, you know, wanted to take, you know, a, a position on, on things in, in terms of things being right and, um, you know, almost, dare I say, a sort of a, a moral position in terms of, and quite rightly so, in terms of, the you know, your life's work and, and your vocation. Did you have a sense that this is where you were headed when you were a kid? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um I probably had a sense pretty early, actually, relative to a lot of my colleagues. Um, uh, I think when I was 16, I went to a boarding school and uh, in the last two years, it was co-ed. Um, and I experienced really quite overt gender discrimination um, as the girls had to be transported to the boys' school and sort of to fit in with that structure. Um, and it was really discriminatory. At the same time, I had some amazing experiences at, uh, with co-education and um, I could really see the disparity and I see, see what needed to be, to be changed early on. I remember in my, I guess, year 11 year, I remember we did a performance and we took the Joe Jackson song, What's a Man Now, What's a Man Mean? And we did like a live performance of it, which was completely radical. And most of the yeah. teachers were falling off their chairs, but it was right <laughs> on the nail. And and I think a lot of us were, you know, that was the late 1980s, you know, in the context of, you know, we had at the time in New Zealand, a nationwide campaign called Girls Can Do Anything. So it was some support for that, but it was nonetheless a very conservative school, so it was pretty <laughs> radical. So I pretty much could see that uh, gender inequality was a root cause um, of a lot of problems in society and that I wanted to be part of uh, addressing those. And I guess in a way you could say I'm on about the same thing my entire life, so maybe <laughs> we haven't got that far, but at the same time I, I think, um, you know, it's been satisfying to to kind of, continue to work on the same basic problem but in different in different uh, terrain and, and now in the in the context of conflict situations and uh, and the spread of violent extremism. Jackie, what is it to be a good man these days? Oh Ray, that's such a tough question and it's not good to ask a female that question. Um, look I, I really really feel like we should also reframe that question and ask what does it mean to be a good person these days? Because men are people. Um, And I don't know that's always good to ask that in a really gender specific way. Um, I'd like to think that the full range of human qualities uh, are available to men as they are to women. Um, And that to be a good person means to be someone who belongs, um, someone who's connected, someone who's responsible um, and is finding their way um, to, to, you know, to, um, you know, 
promote the betterment of, you know, whatever community uh, they're in. And if you had a story that you could tell a 14-year-old boy and he'd listen, what would the story be? Yes, that's a great question. I have been thinking about this one because I'm not sure I've been the most influential person with 14-year-old boys. Um, So this is what I'd say. You're 14, you've got a few more years of school to go, but don't think you have to wait till you leave school or till after to, to act now and to do the thing that you're passionate about or to take forward the idea that you have. Just think of... Greta Thunberg, who at age 15 had had enough with world leaders, with the people in her country's government um, in terms of their responses to, uh, you know, killing really the planet slowly but, but uh, um, you know, definitively. And so she decided, uh, you know, in August 2018 to sit outside the Swedish parliament every Friday with her school for climate strike. Um, and who would think that now, you know, sort of two and a half years later, there's not a week goes by when there isn't a stri- school strike and that young people all around the world have mobilised as a result of her action. And also to point out, you know, she was a young person with sort of relatively, spe- you know, did some level of disadvantage as well. Um, so I think, you know, and I also look to my own son who in year 11 You know, he wants to be a filmmaker. I mean, it seems like a pie in the sky, but who's going to dissuade him from that? Um, Who decided he was going to make a a feature film um, and learnt and taught himself each day, you know, you know, different skills that he needed to do that. He taught himself a little bit of how to how to write a legal contract, you know, how how to, um, you know, how to employ people, how to audition people, and then, then literally how to, you know, all of those other things. And he did it in year 11. So, and there's lots of examples of kids around and, and even kids at Bright and Grammar too, who have, who've, who've acted on, on their, on their passion, on their idea, even at a young age. And so I would just say, go for it. Don't wait. Yeah. You know, the time is now. Fantastic advice, Jackie. And just like you, you're sitting back in New Zealand at the school and looking ahead um, and starting that process to uh, someone who's having a real impact, uh, not only in Australia, but more broadly with your work and research that you do. On behalf of all of us here at, at Understanding Boys, I want to thank you very much for your time today in our conversation, which we really enjoyed. Thank you and uh, we hope you have a great Christmas. Thanks, Ray, and, and uh, uh, you know, I hope, I hope you have a great uh, 2021 as well. We hope you've enjoyed this Understanding Boys podcast. Make sure you subscribe on your podcast app and please leave us a review to help grow the community. For more information about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.